transform agriculture in Africa. Welcome to the 2021 edition of the High Level Dialogue on Feeding Africa. Leadership to scale up successful innovations. Co-hosted by the African Development Bank and the International Fund for Agricultural Development in collaboration with the Forum for Agricultural Research in Africa, the CGIAR and AGRA. Be part of the conversation. Your Excellencies, Ambassadors, Ladies and Gentlemen, welcome to the high-level virtual dialogue on Feeding Africa, Leadership to Scale Up Successful Innovations, co-hosted by the African Development Bank and IFAD. This virtual dialogue is part of the United Nations Food Systems Summit being held in October 2021, and one of the outcomes will be a communique signed during this event. We welcome African heads of state, ministers of finance, development and agriculture, heads of multilateral development banks, national, regional and international research institutions, as well as global and regional agribusinesses. We have great ambitions for this event. And with the impressive lineup of speakers and our great audience connecting from around the world, we will meet the ambitions. What is our challenge? The low level of productivity of major staple crops is at the heart of Africa's uncompetitive agriculture and primordial commodity value chains. And scary fact, around a third of calories consumed in Africa is imported from outside the continent. Africa needs to rebuild stronger and more resilient food systems. Food systems refer to a myriad of complex activities that include the production, processing, transport, and consumption of food. It involves such issues as food sustainability, the impact of food on individual and population health, and more. But there is good news. Increased investments in regional and national agriculture, technology delivery systems, in agricultural research and development, and scaling up of technology to boost agricultural productivity, increase food production, and strengthen the food system. During the next few days, we'll share success stories of how countries have moved towards self-sufficiency in food production in just three crop seasons so that we can arrest the productivity decline. We will also refocus attention and investment in agricultural research and development, both public and private, and improved synergies between the two. The words synergies and collaboration are key. Whilst well-functioning silos are essential for safely storing grain, silos in the agricultural delivery and research ecosystem are detrimental. We are all here on this platform and we will share our learnings and develop a shared vision of how to mobilize and utilize investments in innovation and technology for transformation of African food systems. So, your excellencies, ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, we have our work cut out for us. And without further ado, let's get started. It is now... We welcome to this high level dialogue on achieving food security in Africa. It's the opening session for this um, two day dialogue. And um, my two co hosts in this particular event are Dr. Akin Adeshino, who is president of the African Development Bank, and Gilbert Ungbo, who is president of IFAD, the International Fund for Agricultural Development. And they are joined by the distinguished Tony Blair former British Prime Minister who has set up the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, looking at some of the key challenges um, of our era. So um, what are we going to discuss? Well, look, the headline is this. Africa has 60% of the world's arable land, 
and yet it cannot feed its own people. It has a food import bill of around $80 billion every year, and 70% of Africans cannot afford to have a healthy diet. So it's a supreme tragic irony that these are very glaring statistics. And what we want to do in this opening session is just to examine this chronic failure of Africa's food and agricultural systems and just ask what can we be doing? What should we do to really get the system working for all Africans? So Dr. Akin Adeshina, you're going to kick off with some um, opening thoughts really. And um, Dr. Akin, I do remember when you first became president of the African Development Bank back in 2015, you launched your high fives and Feed Africa was one of those. And here you are, your second term, and we're still having this conversation. So please set the scene for us as to, you know, what are the main barriers, the challenges that have to be overcome so that Africa can start feeding itself? Over to you, Dr. Adeshina. Thank you very much, uh, Zineb. Uh, Your Excellencies, heads of state and government, honorable ministers, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I wish to thank you immensely for making the time to join us at this Leaders Dialogue on Feeding Africa, a critical dialogue for the development of Africa. The African Development Bank is pleased to co-organize this event with the International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD. The president of IFAD, my dear friend, Mr. Hongo, and I most appreciate your honoring our joint invitation. It's great to see you, Tony Blair, former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Your Excellency, COVID-19 has wrecked havoc. Aside from the number of people that have died, the impact on Africa's food security has been severe. Today, 246 million Africans go to bed hungry each day. Unfortunately, for many in Africa, the risk of actually dying from hunger is many times higher than dying from COVID-19. To fully recover from this pandemic, Africa must now rapidly upscale efforts to boost food production. Without food, medicines don't work. Without nutrition, vaccines are simply not effective. Your Excellences, we must produce food on less land, and we must conserve forests, and we must ensure sustainability and climate resilience. Technologies to feed Africa exist. What has been lacking has been a comprehensive approach to take them to scale with accountability for impacts. To take technologies off the shelves and get them into the hands of farmers, there is need for a technology delivery and development platform that works at scale. Your Excellences, that is exactly what has been done by the Bank Supported Technologies for African Agricultural Transformation, called TAAT, or just call it TAT, a technology and innovation delivery platform supported by the bank Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, IFAD, and several other partners. Launched just two years ago, the TAT platform has delivered heat tolerant wheat varieties to 1.8 million farmers in seven countries, increasing wheat production by 1.4 million metric tons to the value of $291 million. Across Sudan and Ethiopia, hundreds of thousands of hectares are now planted to this heat tolerant. With varieties. When drought hit Southern Africa region in 2018-2019, TAT came to the rescue. It deployed drought-tolerant maize varieties, which were cultivated by 5.2 million households on 841,000 hectares. Just think about that. As a result, farmers survived the drought from Zimbabwe, Malawi, and Zambia, allowing maize production to expand by 631,000 metric tons with a value of $107 million. We are boosting rice production. New high yielding rice varieties from TAT has been cultivated on 1.4 million hectares, impacting 2.2 million households and boosting rice production by an additional 285,000 metric tons that's estimated to be worth $108 million. Your Excellences, in just two years, TAT has worked across 28 African countries 
on 76 proven agricultural technologies across 14 crops and reached 11 million farmers. Food production has expanded by over 12 million metric tons. TART has saved countries' food imports worth $814 million. Your Excellences, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, their achievements to date have been impressive. We must now go to scale to feed 1.4 billion people in Africa, taking advantage of the market opportunities provided by the African Continental Free Trade Area. And that's why we are here today for this leaders' dialogue. Your Excellences, we need your strong political leadership to turn Africa into an agricultural powerhouse. We have the technologies. We have the technology delivery platform to do it. We now need better policy incentives. We need greater access to financing to support agricultural research and transformation. And we need to develop special agro-industrial processing zones to add value to food produce. Your Excellences, as Africa goes to the United Nations Food Systems Summit, we are already showing results never before seen at this scale in Africa. The African Development Bank will put greater support behind efforts to feed Africa. The African Development Bank will invest 10.4 billion US dollars over the next five years to boost the development of agricultural value chains and food production in Africa. The bank will also invest $1.6 billion in the next five years to support 10 strategic crops to drive food security. We will do our part, but greater amounts of resources are needed to feed Africa. So your excellences, partners, friends of Africa, let us now forge today a stronger partnership, a partnership for greater scale, a partnership to take technologies and innovations to hundreds of millions of farmers, a partnership to develop markets for agriculture, a partnership that unleashes the creativity of the youth and women in agriculture, a partnership to use agriculture to create decent jobs and wealth for Africa. Together we can. Thank you all very much and welcome. Thank you very, Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Akin Adeshina, for um, your opening remarks and that very clear rallying cry that you have there for a partnership across all sectors to really bring this um, you know, ambition of Africa feeding itself um, mm -hmm. to fruition. Uh, Gilbert Ungbo, since 2017, you have been president of uh, IFAD. You also chair UN Water, which uh, brings together all the UN bodies as well as other international organizations, about 30 in total, working in water and sanitation. And of course, water is related to the topic of um, agriculture. You're also a former prime minister of your native Togo, and you spent a decade in the private sector. So really you cover all bases when we're talking about the uh, key members of this partnership. So I wonder if you could talk to us a bit about the role of research, of which you do a great deal um, at IFAD, about you know what actually research tells us about how to improve food production and the kinds of innovation that are needed that Dr. Um, Adeshna has already alluded to in his opening remarks. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Zenaib. And uh, let me join uh, Dr. Adesina in welcoming um, all the uh, uh, our distinguished uh, um, guests, particularly the Excellency, the head of state and government, the ministers, and uh, that are joining us uh, this uh, um, um, this morning. Um, you know, I, I think uh, Dr. Adesina said it uh, all in terms of uh, um, introductory um, remark. If I want to focus on the uh, on the on, on the research is very um, critical that we know, for example, that in Africa, one of the challenges we have in agriculture is the um, the productivity that is quite um, 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 very low. It's but almost kind of one tenth. Uh, when I, I compare, uh, for example, the um, the irrigation in Africa compared to the irrigation in uh, in Asia, uh, for example, and that has a big impact on on productivity. Uh, we know uh, that one third of uh, um, 
um, our uh, the the whole calorie intake, one third of it is imported annual basis, um, and out of the forty six billion of imports, um, the ten critical um, staple foods um, are two third of those imports. So. While that looks like um, a, a big challenge, we see it as an opportunity, turning that into a potent opportunity. But that opportunity can only work if our research and development centers are really galvanized. We know that there's a lot of work that has been uh, um, ongoing in many research. I can talk about the, the NERICA from Africa uh, um, um, Rice uh, Center or the, the work done in terms of adapting the, uh, the, the, the wheat production uh, in, uh, in, in Africa um, so that it can also grow in Africa to reduce the huge import of uh, wheat-based uh, flour or related products. So is, that research is going to be um, at the center, at the center of any solution. And linked to that is also innovation and technology. That's why the, the linkage of the point that um, and Dr. Desina just made very clearly comes to, um, and to, to play. So what I really would like to advocate is, obviously, we have worldwide the whole consortium, the CGAR, and out of which we have a lot of components in Africa. Time has come as part of the food system um, summit called by the Secretary General uh, Gutierrez, the UNSG, is going to be important for us to bring up the contribution and the role that the Africa Research Centers will play, not only in, 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 in raw research and development, but in applied um, research, moving from their finding, bringing that to production, particularly, and I want to insist on that, particularly to the small scale um, producers. And we know for Africa, in, in Africa, 80% of our food production are still coming from small scale, two, three hectares um, um, production. So it's going to be important that those research centers, we get the result and the result gets down to, uh, uh, to them. My final point in, in that, I want to link that importantly to the technology side that, uh, um, uh, Dr. Adesina has uh, intro, uh, introduced, is to look at it from the whole value chain, from the production onto the consumption. And in, in, in the case of Africa, given the, the huge amount of import we have now, it's going to be quite important to look at that middle ground, I mean the transformation, once you deal with the productivity um, side, looking at it for transformation, uh, including the, the, the fight against uh, food waste and, uh, and loss, addressing the, the, the nutrition side, another important dimension why we need the research um, center, and finally, uh, uh, research and development. And finally, look at that, the access to the market, um, bringing the technology and the access to the market. My very final point, and I give back the floor as a night, is that innovation and that research and development is not just Roger, on the production yeah. side, it's not just on the food side. It's also on the products like the, the uh, insurance that we desperately need, um, insurance against um, extreme weather um, condition because of the climate change. We know that our um, product, uh, pro uh, producers need to change the way we practice um, agri uh, agriculture and to be able to assist them much better than we are doing today in terms of insurance against those calamities um, is going to be um, critical as well. So let me stop here, but in sake of um, time management, over to you. Yeah, you've raised a lot of issues there, which I hope we'll have time to um, touch on, in particularly, as you said, um, giving access um, not only for food production, loans and so on, but also for um, crop insurance uh, alongside all the education on, and research that you talk about. Thank you very much indeed, um, uh, Gilbert Ungbo. So Tony Blair, of course, you were British Prime Minister from 1997 to 2007. Uh, ever since you left um, Downing Street, you've been very active on the world stage. Um, in particular, you've set up the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, looking at very much what the developing world, 
in particular Africa can do to meet um, the myriad challenges that um, it has to face. So we've heard what the United Nations and multilateral institutions like the African Development Bank can do, but you spend a lot of time advising governments as to how they can best achieve um, the right policies to achieve food security. So I wonder if you could just give us in your opening remarks an idea of what governments need to do the most to implement their commitments, in particular to scale up um, agricultural you know, innovations that we've heard our two co-hosts touch on there. So over to you, Tony Blair. We can't hear you, Tony. You need to press the... Uh... I know you're not a big fan of Zoom, but uh, it does help if we can hear you. <laughs> yep, there are some people who say I'm better muted most of the time, but... <laughs> In this case, we'd love to hear what you have to say. <laughs> I'm so Go sorry. Ahead. Thanks. Um, Zainab, uh, thank you very much. Heads of state, heads of government, excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be with you all, especially with two such uh, distinguished preceding speakers, President Adeshina and President Ungbo, and um, they've set the, the scene wonderfully. I, I just wanted to add these remarks. So my institute is a not-for-profit institute. We, we really focus on the question of governance, uh, and we focus it from the point of view of how do you get how do you make government effective? I mean, I will say to people when they criticize uh, leaders, before you criticize governments, try governing, because it's a difficult job. And so after my 10 years in, in office, I decided to try and apply some of those lessons, really focused on what is the biggest challenge of government, which is getting things done, implementation. But in this last two or three years, we've also focused on what I think is the biggest real world event going on globally, obviously COVID um, is a huge event, but if you look at the underlying trend, the biggest thing going on is the technology revolution. It's gonna change everything. It's gonna change the way we live, the way we work, the way we interact with each other. And so the question is how does government harness the possibilities of that technology revolution for the public good? And the question of agriculture arises because agriculture, of course, is of huge importance to the continent of Africa. And yet it's only recently that the full technological possibilities of agricultural innovation have, have come to our notice. But if you think, to give two different examples, if you think of the way that renewable energy has been transformed commercially and in operation over this last, what, two decades, it's been a, its own mini revolution. And that's all been as a result of developing technology. And then through the COVID crisis, if you think of how long it used to take us to develop vaccines and leave aside all the vaccine equity and inequity, but if you think about the acceleration of technology development through COVID, it's been remarkable. So the question, I think the good starting point for this discussion is, how do we make that happen in respect of agriculture and Africa? And here's where the, the, what the African Development Bank has done under President Adeshina's leadership is so important because they've demonstrated it is possible. I mean, that, that program um, for heat resistant uh, wheat that they, they have done across um, seven countries in Africa, I mean, that has made a demonstrable and defined difference. So we know it can be done. And I think we're talking about this agricultural transformation a bit like we were talking about renewable energy, solar power, um, you know, mini and off grids in the energy sector a few years back. Then a lot of people questioned whether it was possible. Now we know it is possible. So the question is how, how do we put it together? And I would just like to make four points briefly. The first is, and I know we're gonna discuss this in more depth, the question of financing where we need to mobilize not just the big institutional uh, investors from the international financial institutions, and of course, the players like the um, AFDB, but also the private sector, venture capital. Secondly, how do we make sure that we're getting the best companies available, thinking that they can go and 
and, and invest in Africa and bring their technologies to Africa and make most of the technological innovation happening on the continent of Africa itself. I mean, one of the things that I've learned in the last couple of years is there's technology companies springing up all over Africa as well. The tech sector in Africa is underappreciated, but it's coming and it's growing all the time. But how do we make sure that we create the right circumstances for companies with the technologies, whether it's in drones and satellites and seeds and fertilizer, whatever it is, water, irrigation, how do we make sure that they come and, and um, apply their technologies? How do we do the right research and development, which is where the IFAD um, initiatives are so important and, and the idea of setting up a big research and development center in Africa also absolutely vital. And then finally, how do we make sure that government is properly organized in order to take advantage of these opportunities? So that's what, you know, these are the things that I think are, are the vital questions for us. But I, I say this with a, a sense that it, you know, we are on the cusp of a whole new development in Africa's history and economy. And if we can bring it together in the right way, it's gonna be immensely exciting and hugely beneficial for the people. Thanks very much indeed, Tony. And indeed we will um, talk about finance and also the role of innovation and technology in this discussion. But at the outset, when you mentioned your kind of four areas, you talked about the role of the private sector. And of course, Aliko Dangote, the um, Nigerian um, businessman who, who heads um, Dangote Industries, was going to be um, with us, but um, has urgent business matters to attend to. And um, I know that um, he is doing a great deal in this area. So, for example, you know, he's got high, he's looking at um, drought resistance, you know, crops and um, high yielding crops with his rice um, initiatives and also sugar, both in Nigeria and in Ghana. He's also trying to add value to, um, you know, raw products like tomatoes produced in, in, in Nigeria, having a canning plant to make them into tomato paste to reduce Nigeria's um, import bill of tomato paste, mostly from Italy, by about 30 percent. So you've got clear examples, as you say, of uh, the private sector really trying to do at scale um, the uh, kind of um, initiatives that we're discussing. But let's just look at finance, because this is a very, very clear area where much more needs to be done. Of course, we know that the Malabo Declaration back in 2014, African government said that they would invest about 10% of public spending on agriculture. Only a handful of countries have done that to um, date. So let me ask you all, what can we do to find ways of financing the kind of innovations in food production that you're talking about and getting it into the right places? The private sector, encourage governments to spend more and also want to put this idea to you, do we need a kind of global alliance whereby, you know, you have something along the lines of Gavi to really come together to feed Africa? So, Dr. Um, Akin Adeshina, some rapid fire answers on these, please, because we don't have a lot of time. Thanks. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting that after you mentioned the the issue of Gavi and all that, you know, the the difference between getting vaccines and 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 therapeutic medicines out is that uh, those it, are, are largely communicable diseases. Now, hunger is not communicable, and therefore it's very it's very difficult to do that way to to, to box and get where you get this and you and you roll it out. However, I want to say something about what Tony said about accountability before we start looking at the financing. There needs to be political accountability for hunger. I, I, I think just that like we have 246 uh, million people that don't have access to food is unacceptable. So there has to be political accountability for hunger. But then, then there has to be financial systems accountability to ensure that we can deal with that. And so we have the technologies. And Tony was just talking to you about the, 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 in your country, the, the, the issue of the heat tolerant uh, wheat lines that we got there. You know, uh, through this type program, we were able to deliver 65,000 metric tons of certified seed of those things, Tony, to them in Sudan. Now, just to break it down for somebody who doesn't understand what that means in agriculture, if you take an A380 aircraft, that's the largest aircraft you have, passenger aircraft, the people, the, I mean, the, the, the fuel and the cargo, it's about 98.4 metric tons. So you're talking about 660 A380 aircraft lying on a landing street. That's the kind of impact you have. And that has allowed them to actually increase food security by 50%. Now, how do you take these kind of things to scale? 
Now, that's where I want to come to the issue of the finance. I think it's time for us to set up a, a, a financing facility for food nutrition, um, in a food security and nutrition in Africa. What will that do? It, would, it will operate differently from the Gavis and all that. First is that in the case of Gavi and the Global Fund, they take technologies that are developed outside Africa and they bring it to Africa. They aggregate and they sell. But in this particular case, like Gilbert said, we need to finance the R&D system in Africa, the global, the regional, and the national, to actually get innovations out. Secondly, is that it will support the scaling up of these technologies to scales of hundreds of millions that we have just been talking about. Yeah. Then we have biofortified uh, food crops. We actually have food fortification that we can take to scale. And finally, we also need to support school feeding programs in a comprehensive way. So we actually feel it's time to really have um, a global alliance that we move together to have this fund or this facility uh, for food security and nutrition in Africa to take what we know exists, goes to scale, but not based on bringing things from outside, use Africa's R&D, use African farmers to produce uh, things and then support the R&D system to get technologies to scale. The time for that is now, and I think Gilbert and I talked about it, and we think we need to do it right now. All right. Well, Gilbert um, Ungbo, tell us what you think about that. Mobilize Africa's domestic resources in all sorts of ways, a, a finance facility, a fund, an alliance or whatever. Is this an idea whose time has really come? Will it fly? Clearly, the, the, time, has, uh, the time has come. You know, uh, first of all, you need to recognize that a lot has been um, done. Um, both in domestic finance, you you write by saying that only few African countries are able to meet the the, um, the Malabo declaration with the 10% budget to the to the uh, to AG. However, if you look at in the year 2000, since the uh, MDG era, a lot has been accomplished, and we see the results uh, improving. Yet the gap, the gap still there. The two the 246 million that. Uh, um, um, Adesina um, uh, referred to still uh, still quite uh, quite uh, stunning uh, big problem we have. Then recently, um, CRS report CRS twenty thirty um, report clearly identified that if we were to get any, any anywhere near the SDG by twenty thirty, we need more um, investment in ag, fourteen billion from ODA and 19, 19 billion from domestic budget plus 52 million from the private sector, which makes it 85 billion a year between now and 2030. So it's, it's, it's really huge. But then if you look at the ODA, um, ODA has been increasing and we really appreciate that. However, the portion of ODA going to agriculture has been flat at 5% or six, between 5 and 6% for decades now. Uh, which in itself is a problem. So where I fully uh, agree in agreement uh, with Dr. Desina is the fact that we, of course, ODA has to remain our backbone but in the domestic budgets. But we need to be innovative by creating new financing instruments to make sure that we can continue invest in agriculture in, uh, uh, in Africa. All right. Right, thank you. So, uh, Tony Blair, there, you've got this idea of this um, alliance, the three pillars public spending, private sector, but also ODA. And uh, as Yuba Ungbo says, this has flattened. Um, so, what do you think of this idea for this new global alliance? Is it something you'd put your weight behind? Yeah, no, for sure. I think it's, it's absolutely what's needed. I mean, I think the, the two points I would make are first of all, there isn't a shortage of finance in the world right now. I mean, the, 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 there, there is a lot of liquidity. And the question is, how do you, how do you organize it effectively in support of, of, of actual projects? And here's where I think, you know, the AFDB and others can, can play a part and, and linking up, I think, with other financial institutions around the world to be sort of anchor investments, investors in some of the funds that are going to be necessary. Um, and I think that's one, the financing part of this, I think is, is solvable if there's the right coordination um, at, a, at a multilateral level. I think the second thing I would say though is that it is important to focus on what governments have got to do 
to get their own house in order so that they can take advantage of these opportunities. And they will need the right regulatory environment. Um, they will need you know, a combination of local investment, but also investors coming in from outside. There may well be things around land use, land registration, of course, infrastructure that they need to look at in order to, to make this work properly. And I think that, that you know, for, for, for governments, it's, this is, this is a, a challenge that crosses many different government departments. So they have to get yeah. people coming together and working together across the traditional silos. But, you know, if, if, if we really focus down on the elements that are necessary to make this work, and we, we've, we've got all the ingredients, it's, it's just a question of putting them together in the right mix. And I think this is where, you know, if, if governments are working together, I mean, we, we've got a project, for example, in Senegal uh, with President Macky Sall there, Agrifol Sud, it's called, which is looking at value chains across um, agriculture. And one of the things, of course, that often happens is that Africa doesn't capture the full value of the produce that it's, um, it's creating. So you need all of these different bits put together, but, you know, they're all there, ready to be assembled. Right. Yeah, sure. And of course, um, getting the finances is, is the, an important thing, but also making sure it reaches the right people and that it's targeted is a big, big challenge. And I know that at IFAD, you aim this year to increase by 20 percent the incomes of um, 20 million poor small scale food producers, um, Mr. Ungbo, and half of them are women. So we must also make sure that women do receive, um, you know, any of the financing and the funding that goes on. So that gender focus is very, very important. We've also talked about the road of research institutions. And, you know, we know that lots of technological solutions are being piloted, as uh, Dr. Adeshina has said, and we need to spread the learnings and insights about what kind of agriculture works. But look, Africa is a big place. You need geographical data to get an idea of how best to respond to different regions and countries and, you know, the underlying chronic conditions um, may vary. So if we want a proper targeted response, um, how important is it that we scale up this role of um, technology, as Tony was talking about, you know, the use of drones and satellites and so on? Um, a quick rapid response from all of you, Dr. Adeshina, first. Yeah, you know, especially with the, uh, Zinab, the, the issue of climate change, I think the having digital advisory services is going to be a key component of farmers being able to adapt to that, uh, from floods to drought and all that. So just having really information in your hands and the power of mobile phones actually provides that. Um, I think um, we can do that. We, we launched a program uh, together with the Global Center for Adaptation, um, which is called the uh, African Adaptation Acceleration Program. And that program is to mobilize $25 billion to allow Africa to adapt to climate change because you know, it's very, very critical. But one of the key elements of that program is what we're trying to do with digital advisory services for farmers on climate change. So that would suppose to reach about, say, uh, 30 or uh, 40 million farmers with digital advisory services. Um, Hongwe, uh, Gilbert mentioned an issue earlier on, which I think it's very important as well. Yeah. It's the whole issue of crop insurance. We have today index crop insurance. We have past, you know, insurance for pastoralists and so on that we need to do and, and, and get that out to them. Yeah. But more importantly, I think for me in adapting to climate change is the importance of you know, using water better. Water yeah. issues, water is going to be the most critical thing. So doing that is going to be key. And to do that, that's where the issue of drones comes in. And yeah. that's why we have to get a lot of young people into agriculture as a business. The young people, they are the ones that will use the drones, they use satellite imagery, they yeah. use remote sensing, they use automation. And so we've got to make agriculture really cool for young people. I've been saying that, Tony, you know, you I, and I, when I was- You've been saying that for ages. Yeah, sexy. but I'm excited about, I'm excited about the young people of Africa. They are the, the ones going to turn okay. Africa around. And I remember telling to uh, Aliko Dangote, you mentioned him at the in beginning. Yeah. I told Aliko, the future business, the future millionaires and, and billionaires of Africa will not come from oil and gas industry. They will yeah. come from on the ag business. And I'm glad that he understands that. And I think the young people of Africa understand this right. agriculture as a business is the key. Mm -hmm. Let's 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 help the young people to invest in agriculture. They will turn this place around completely. We don't have much time, so really just very brief comments now. I've only got a couple of minutes. Jobo, Ungbo, 
if you want to respond to this point about uh, technology and, you know, half a billion people in Africa have access to a mobile phone and um, at least a third of those have got smart features. So the role of technology, just briefly. Thank you. Yeah, let me, given the time we have, let me just rather complement what um, Dr. Desina was, uh, was saying by again saying that when people are listening to us here, there's one piece that I want to stress out. Um, we know that the smallholders are not going to have direct access to the, um, to the drones overnight. And that's why it's important to, to invest through the youth as uh, um, Akin has uh, mentioned. So globally, I will simply say that it's important to make also the technology available and affordable. Um, and again, the financing issue will, uh, will come um, to play here. And not only at the production, as we said, and across the line. And if we can even start with yeah. basics that help them um, alleviate the, um, the, 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 the difficulties that they are facing in um, practicing ag itself, it makes ag much more cool. And I like that term, uh, Akin, um, for, the, for, 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 for the youth. So making the technology affordable and available. All right. Last word goes to you, Tony Blair. Yeah, just a very brief point. I mean, when you talk about mobile phones, um, I mean, think of the revolution that's been in financial payments in Africa. You know, it's it's not as if Africa can't adapt and use technology. Actually, some of the most enlightened people around the technology sector are in Africa. And the good thing about the conversation we've had is that all the ele elements are there. We know what needs to happen. So I'm 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 going to end on a, a note of optimism. I I think this is a huge challenge. But I think we know what we need to do. I think the means of doing it at our, at our disposal and what we need now is to have the political will and the, and the, you know, the focus on implementation. And if we do that, we will succeed. Thank you so much indeed, Tony, and for ending on a high note. You're competing with Dr. Akina Deshina, who is often described as Africa's optimist in chief. <laughs> there you go. You have a rival there, <laughs> Tony Blair, and uh, our two co-hosts, Dr. Akina Deshina of um, the African Development Bank and Gilbert Ungbo from IFA. Thank you very much much indeed. We've only skimmed the surface so much to talk about, but I think we have shown that we need action across a lot of sectors in this area of Africa feeding itself, but it unlocks development, um, you know, right across the board. So excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to this very stimulating conversation. One very clear takeaway message there about this new um, fund to um, feed Africa. So some food for thought for you there. Um, from me, Zain Abadawi, it's been my pleasure to be with all of you, and I wish you fruitful and productive discussions in the um, two days of this high-level dialogue on food security of Africa.